Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Welcome back, everybody, to Fire University. Uh, Today we're going to talk about upland hardwoods again, particularly oak forests. Uh, Many of our listeners I know either work or own land within the southern Appalachians or the central hardwoods regions. So we're trying to spend some time on that, particularly because uh, we've had some problems in that system, or some perceived problems at least, with oak transition to other forest types. So I have Dr. Heather Alexander and Dr. Steve Brewer here with me today. And uh, I wanted to allow both of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves before we get started. All right, I'll go first. Uh, Well, (laughs) so I am a a professor at Auburn University and I just started here. I I spent five years at Mississippi State University in the forestry department before coming here, but I'm in the School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences. And a pretty big chunk of my research program is thinking about the role of fire in upland hardwood forests. So working mostly in um, oak forest and the, the Appalachians and like Marcus said, the central hardwood forest region, but thinking about, you know, put fire back into those systems and how important it is for maintaining, especially oak and um, hickory species. So uh, something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Well, I'm Steve Brewer, and I'm a professor of biology at the University of Mississippi. Uh, My training has been in plant ecology, um, and I've, for a long time since graduate school, have been interested in fire and uh, how plants respond to fire, uh, plant adaptations to fire, um, how fire influences uh, species diversity. Um, and I've been at Ole Miss since 96, and most of my work with fire has been either in upland oak or mixed oak shortleaf pine ecosystems or in longleaf pine ecosystems, uh, uh, particularly the uh, lower uh, kind of wet savanna ecosystems. So I kind of split my time between those uh, uh, systems. And I've been, <clears throat> uh, I started a long-term experiment of fire restoration um, at a place called Strawberry, uh, Strawberry Plains Audubon Preserve in Northern Mississippi back in 2004. And I've been you know, interested in those questions for quite a while. Very cool. I, uh, I just wanted to interject for, for those of you that know about the Mississippi State Ole Miss rivalry, We can still uh, have a reasonable conversation together. So I just wanted to point that out that uh, Heather and I both were were faculty and I even got my undergrad at Mississippi State and uh, we're still able to talk with Ole Miss. (laughs) Last year, actually, Marcus, uh, Steve and I met up at a First at Strawberry Plains, he just described, and then we went over to a site that you and I work on in northern Mississippi, but we took a picture of both of our field trucks, nose to nose, you know, so you can see both of the, the <laughs> logos and then posted it on the website so we could, we could prove that there, there truly can be collaboration between those two universities. Yeah, that's great. I don't know about Auburn and Alabama, but uh, Ole not Miss. Not going there yet. <laughs> <laughs> not going there? We're not going there yet, you know, maybe, but maybe one day. At least, at least uh, the three universities with University of Florida as well, we can all... Oh, yeah communicate to one another <laughs> in a reasonable, prudent manner. So, yeah. So uh, the reason I wanted to have both of you on the show is because you're, 
your, your experts in this area with upland hardwoods and, and particularly the role of fire in that system. And I, I worked with you recently on a, a manuscript that uh, just got accepted in bioscience. So we'll put a link to that uh, on social media at UF Gear Lab so that people can look at it if they're interested. But uh, when I worked with you guys on that, it really made me understand that, you know, I was taking up on oak dominant, dominated hardwood forest for granted a little bit. I just wanted uh, either of you, whoever wants to chime in, to tell us a little bit about what's going on in these forest systems. I can start and then Steve can maybe chime in with his perspective on this. But yeah, that bioscience paper was really cool and kind of fun to write um, because we started out thinking about a lot of the observations that have been made in upland oak forest across, uh, across the eastern U.S. primarily. But what people have been observing and measuring in studies is this phenomena where if you walk through the forest, you'll be like, oh, wow, you know, there are a lot of big oak trees, lots of big ones. You look into the canopy, lots of uh, oak leaves, and down on the ground, you see lots of oak litter. But then when you start looking for kind of mid-sized saplings and mid-story oaks, they're really missing from those size classes. You might see some seedlings because oak acorns will germinate and you'll get some little guys coming up, but those kind of intermediate size classes are absent. And this is something, it's called the oak bottleneck basically. So if you imagine like a bottle and how it kind of comes together around the neck, uh, that's the phenomenon. Lots of big oaks, you know, it's the wide part of, part of the bottle and the mouth of the bottle are the seedlings, but there's this constriction in the middle. And, you know, people are really worried about this because oaks are so important for our wildlife species. They're, they produce a, a mast or an acorn and, uh, you know, all sorts of things depend on that. But they're also really important because they control things like how water moves through the forest and how nutrients are cycled. And uh, what we're going to talk about in a little bit, I think, is, is uh, the flammability of the forest. And so we're seeing, you know, changes in what species are starting to occupy those middle size classes. What that means is when the big oaks die, they're going to be the ones that replace them. And so not only are we seeing changes in the composition, but we're also seeing a lot more of those little non-oak guys hanging out in the mid-story. And so it's getting much more dense, much more shady, and that's changing all sorts of things. And so Steve, you know, he thinks a lot about the herbaceous layer, so the non-woody things that grow in the understory. So we're seeing that change too. Yeah, um, I uh, became interested. I actually got my start uh, with fire ecology, studying longleaf pine ecosystems. And, and those, you know, were open systems with a very diverse, uh, grassy uh, understory. And as Heather said, I was very interested in trying to understand uh, the herbaceous plant communities. And it was only secondarily, you know, after I came to Ole Miss that I got more interested in oak dominated ecosystems because uh in northern mississippi that's that's one of the dominant systems is uh oak or oak mixed with short leaf pine which are fairly similar systems with regard to uh, uh fire regimes um but the thing that i notice is what heather mentioned and what's been written about in the literature quite a bit and that is this uh these more or less closed canopy forests with very sparse understories, uh, oaks in the, in the canopy, seedlings on the ground, but not a lot of mid-story. And one of the things that um, <clears throat> uh, interested me is that if, you know, were the, the uh, several studies showing that fire alone didn't seem to be kind of turning it back to this uh, system in which you'd have natural oak regeneration uh, in, in the system. And it made me think, well, yeah, I mean, really probably what is needed is a more open canopy so that uh, in, a, in addition to fire, and, um, and that made me think about, well, a more, if you open up the canopy and burn, you're gonna get a lot more herbaceous species uh, responding to that, that kind of, those kinds of treatments. And so uh, I've been interested in, you know, looking at that, how opening the canopy and uh, restoring 
frequent fire, how that affects not only oak regeneration, but also how it affects the, the diversity of ground cover species, species that were indicative of open, you know, oak woodlands in the past, species that are important wildlife uh, uh, food plants or cover plants. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I've been interested in. Well, I think that's probably the more wildlife focused out of us. Uh, those same characteristics that you're talking about that developed understory with with the herbaceous component is really important structurally for a lot of the species that we're interested in, wildlife species and and managing for. So it's kind of it's interesting to get your take on it. So it sounds like we have a lot of mature oaks in the overstory, and they're producing acorns, which is important, but we're in this closed canopy system in most of the, the range that we're talking about now, right? So we don't have much sunlight getting through. And it sounds like, uh, Heather, you said that the seed, you know, the, the acorns may germinate and produce seedlings, but you would think, if that was happening every year, some of those would eventually make it into the mid-story and that's not happening. No, and actually it's, it's pretty amazing because what's happening is a lot of those seedlings are just hanging out on the forest floor, barely surviving. Like they're getting enough light that they can produce just enough, you know, sugar and carbon to sustain themselves, but they're not growing any bigger. They're basically just getting out competed for light by all these other things that are coming in. And so then the question becomes, well, why is this happening? Why are all these things coming in? You know, and that's where fire comes into the story, right? Because if you start looking back about kind of the history of the system and when this, I guess what you would call a problem started to happen where these systems were getting really, really dense and you weren't getting a lot of what we call regeneration of oak in those mid-story classes. Um, it kind of correlates time-wise with when we started to intentionally suppress fire in this country, which was around the, the 1930s or so when we had the big push for, you know, put out all fires, fires are bad. Um, there's been some reconstructions of forests. Todd Hutchinson, who's with the Forest Service, published a cool paper a while back that was showed that basically if you look at the number of oaks that were regenerating prior to that 1930s era, there were quite a bit and hardly any regeneration of species like red maple, which is kind of like the poster child for uh, this invasion of the mid-story by nine oak species. Uh, that was when oaks started failing to regenerate and species like red maple started to take over right around that 1930s uh, period, right when we started suppressing fire. And then there's all sorts of like cool paleoecological records that they get out of uh, sediment cores and lakes where they can show because pollen of different trees like looks different, right? So they can go back and they can suction these cores in the lake. The deeper you go, the further back in time you go. And you can look at which pollen of what trees was occurring when. And then charcoal also shows up in those cores. So you can correlate like when there were periods of high fire, periods of low fire. And there's a pretty good relationship between species like pine and oaks being dominant across the landscape and the prevalence of fire, while species like red maple and sugar maple, cherry, things like that weren't doing as well. Now we're seeing exactly the opposite. So um, there's all sorts of evidence that's sort of linking the prevalence of uh, oaks and pines with fire. I mean, they have a lot of adaptations too that show that they have evolved in the presence of fire, like really thick bark and that awesome re-sprouting capacity and you know, real drought tolerance and usually sites that are droughty or also uh, or sites that are droughty or those that burn really well. So tons of evidence um, in the literature kind of linking this issue that we're seeing, this transition in composition and structure with um, fire, fire exclusion. That's really interesting, but it, it's also, it, it leads one to think Oh well, if if uh, you know excluding fire from the system started this process where we're moving away from oak dominance and and uh, you know that's limiting oaks from regenerating into this mid-story, it seems intuitive that you would just add fire back to the system and you would get those back. But it sounds like even in in the 
in that case, if you do add fire back, you don't necessarily increase oak regeneration into those classes. So I thought uh, there's, I thought there was something interesting in, in that paper that, that we started to explore. And, uh, you know, the system has changed in a lot of ways that would kind of coincide with that same time frame. The one that I always go back to because I just think it's uh, really interesting to think about is we don't have a billion passenger pigeons flying around in a flock, landing on the trees, breaking all the limbs out of it and defecating on the forest floor. Uh, we also don't have chestnut anymore, which was apparently the most common tree, right? So there's a lot of things that have changed in that system at the same time, and it kind of muddies the water up a little bit. Do you, do you think those kinds of changes are also influencing this process and uh, maybe making it a little bit harder for us to tackle this issue? I, I'll, I'll say something about that. I, I think it's very difficult to know, you know what impact the loss of those species you know, has had uh, on, on these ecosystems. Uh, we, we do know that um, in most of the uh, <clears throat> Southern Ap Appalachians and even parts of the uh, upper coastal plain, you know, American chestnut was, you know, a major uh, uh, component of those forests. And people have kind of speculated about, you know, what its loss has meant, but it's been very, very difficult to you know really get a handle on that. One of the things that is happening, for example, with American chestnut is our attempts to uh, restore it by getting back maybe uh, genetically resistant uh, varieties. But um, there still there still seems to be some question about what role fire would be playing in uh, in the uh, restoration of American chestnut and there's there's there are some disagreements about you know what role fire should play you know with that species if i might may also i also point out that in addition to losses um we've also had some gains we've had some additions to the forest that were not on this continent uh uh before <laughs> and uh and those uh may have some really uh important impacts uh in the oak ecosystems of the eastern United States, many of them uh, are, you know, faced with uh, understory uh, non-native species that could be competing with native species uh, uh, to, uh, and affecting their abundance and persistence. Um, uh, one species in particular that I've been looking at is um, Microstegium viminium or Japanese stilt grass is a common name for it. And it's a, it's a difficult one to deal with in terms of management because it, um, it is shade tolerant. So it can tolerate these fire suppressed conditions that you know, dominate a lot of our oak forests here in the Eastern United States. But it also responds very positively to fire and the opening of canopy. So it actually ends up being a species that uh, is almost like lying in wait in our, <laughs> in our forests. And then when we try to restore fire to those systems, it responds very positively to those restoration uh, conditions as well as well as you know some of the, uh, our native species when they're not having to compete with that species. So there's a potential conflict, you know, management conflict in dealing with that. And, that. and that's not just limited to this particular system. The conflict between fire management and invasive species is one that people see over and over again. They want to restore fire to some sort of historical assemblance, but they're restoring it. They're trying to restore that ecosystem process to a system that now has species that were never there historically and can potentially, you know, interfere with restoration efforts. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point. It's really easy, I guess. I, I get that question all the time when I'm presenting or whatever. People are like, well, if I open up the canopy and I have fire, I'm going to end up with a bunch of bad stuff, which is a common problem, not diminishing that problem at all. Uh, and that one, because we see that happen, it's easy. It's easier, I guess, for me to wrap my head around that than it is 
to wrap my head around what's what what are the consequences of not having one of the most abundant species in it versus now having a really abundant one that was never there before. So uh, a little easier to conceptualize, but you're exactly right. Both of those issues are are uh, you know confounding our our efforts here. So can uh, I, can I add something to that real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Please. Well, it, it was really interesting trying to write this paper and to try to get it published because it got reviewed by, I think, uh, four or five different reviewers. All of them had something to say about the section we tried to write about, you know, why we think fire exclusion is so important and, you know, trying to give a nod to all these other different things that happen simultaneously with fire exclusion that could uh, play into the compositional and structural shifts that we're seeing. And I think one thing that came out of all of that thinking and discussion and getting reviewer comments back from it is that it's really almost impossible for us to say definitively what combination of factors led to what is happening today. We know that fire is important, um, but we also know that there could have been a whole bunch of other things happening. And what, what factors were important were probably different depending on what site you're standing on. Um, and so, but the, the most important thing I think that I gained from that process was that what we really need to be thinking about is what, what's important today. You know, what is it that we need to think about today that could help us achieve whatever stand conditions we want to achieve for whatever objective it is that we're trying to uh, manage for. And so, um, so that kind of led to like the rest of the paper, right? Like we had this part kind of thinking about what got us, got us to where we are. And then there's this like, okay, well, what's going on now? What are the, what are the real issues and what do we need to do? And so it was a really interesting process kind of thinking all through all of that. Sure. Uh, I think that's a, a great segue into what I wanted to get into as well. You know, it, we recognize that fire probably is, an, is playing an important role in the system. And certainly from, depending on what your objective is, uh, if you're interested in regenerating oak or uh, improving wildlife habitat or increasing plant diversity, you know, all of these things fire can play an important role in. But uh, <clears throat> once this forest structure, I guess, and composition has started uh, shifting, it's making it more difficult to use that tool in the system. And I thought it'd be really interesting to get uh, both of your perspective on this since you're really uh, interested in experts in understanding traits associated with these different species and how they influence the system. And more importantly, how they influence whether or not we can even use fire in the system to try to meet these goals. So uh, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about some of these transitions and communities that have led to to changes in fuels and how that affects our ability to manage it to begin with. Well, I, I'll say something, and I know Heather will have a lot to say about um, you know the fuels and the changes in the fuels. Um, <clears throat> I one thing that I think people need to understand is historically in these systems, fires were frequent, and that frequent fire regime. Uh, basically, I believe, served as a filter, um, and it was a filter that prevented a lot of the non-oak mesophytic tree species from entering the mid and overstory of the system. They may have actually been in these systems, but they would have been uh, a sprout bank, or they would have been very, very uncommon and mainly restricted to more uh, Mesic floodplain uh, systems. They those those species like red maple, sweet gum, they're native species, and they were they were dominant. They were important in floodplain uh, ecosystems in, in the in the mid south, at least, and in much of the uh, other parts of the eastern United States. And so, what happened, I believe, with fire suppression is many of those species escaped what has been termed a fire trap. The fire was keeping them from becoming uh, larger individuals in the forest. Well, now they are part of the forest as mid-size you know, trees, and those trees are not 
necessarily very sensitive to fire. And so simply putting fire back in is not going to put them back in the fire trap, okay? And that's why people have talked about the need to not just use fire, but come in and do thinning, thinning out those so-called off-site species. Um, and then, but you also have to burn because those species will re-sprout um, and they, they re-sprout from fire. They're not, they don't re-sprout as, um, well, let me just say that their re-sprouting ability compared to that of oaks is context is, uh, dependent. So if it's, uh, you know, a system that is not, doesn't have a whole lot of light getting to this uh, forest floor, the, the re-sprouting to fire of those non-oaks is often better than what you'll see for a lot of oaks. Um, and that's because the oaks are also hamstringed by not getting enough light. It's when you have the combination of abundant light and fire that you really see the oaks have that large re-sprouting advantage to fire um, and potential the potential for flipping the system and getting it back to oaks regenerating into the mid-story and the um, uh, mesophytes. Um, probably not doing as well as the oaks in that scenario. Now I will say from my own experience, uh, you're not going to get rid of those mesophytic uh, uh, trees you know, with frequent fire and restoration. I think the best you can really hope for is maybe just changing the size hierarchy, the si you know, getting, getting oaks back into the mid story and maybe uh, restricting some of the non oaks back to maybe the understory. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think that's one thing that I think is an important lesson that people have to be aware of. And that is that simply putting back fire is not going to get back what you had. It might eventually, if you keep doing it for a long, long, long time, but, um, but, uh, a much more efficient way would be to combine uh, fire with other uh, uh, management techniques to try to change the competitive uh, hierarchy of the oaks and the non-oaks. Just to circle back to one of the things that you said is once, once those plants, these, these non-oak plants get into the mid-story or these trees get into the mid-story and over-story, they have escaped that fire trap and they're not necessarily sensitive to fire anymore. It, that was one thing I, I was curious what you have to say about Heather uh, with the, the species traits. They're actually engineering their own environment to, to make them uh, less, I guess, uh, vulnerable to fire. And we, we've even uh, cut a video that we have online that uh, people can go and look at where we talk about this. But uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, some of those traits and how that how these species do that. Sure. So um, just to reiterate what Steve said, because I think it's really important, is that you know once you take fire out of the system for an extended period of time and you allow species like sweet gum and red maple to get a hold, once they get big enough, they can re-sprout really well, and they still uh, sometimes even I've seen trees that are ten inches in diameter that you know fire barely has an effect on. And those trees, once they start, they do a, two different things. One is they, um, they occlude light. So that impacts oaks directly, but they, that occlusion of light, and I'll let Steve talk about this more in a second, is what influences that herbaceous layer. So you stop getting things like, you know, grasses and other really flammable herbaceous species in the understory. So you have a change in your fuel bed that's super important. So that's one way you change the flammability system is you create um, a fuel bed that's now mostly leaf litter rather than being things like grasses. Well, and not only is it leaf litter, but it's leaf litter of species like red maple and sweet gum that have leaf litter traits that are really not very flammable compared to a lot of our upland oak species like post oak and southern red oak and scarlet oak, chestnut oak. Um, 
red, you know, these non-flammable trees that are encroaching, they tend to have really, really thin leaves, leaves that don't curl very well. They're usually pretty small. When they fall on the forest floor, they, uh, uh, they hold a lot of moisture and they lay really flat and get really, really dense. So you try to put a flame on the ground and there's really nothing there that's gonna ignite very well. And so you've got a fuel bed that's non-flammable litter, and then you've got a fuel bed that doesn't have any grasses in it, and now it's really shady as well, right? So then those fuels just stay moister longer than they would have if the canopy was, was open. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. You look at like an oak leaf, it tends to curl a lot. So you've got all these little points that are sticking up that it will catch a, catch a flame if it comes through. It creates a really um, kind of aerated fuel bed. So there's lots of oxygen, which fire needs to move through. And the non-oaks, like we've done some cool experiments, which we can talk about in a minute, but man, things like wing gum and sweet gum, those leaves lay so flat, stay so moist, and it's, you know, it's hard to, you could put a drip torch right up to wing down and it'll hardly move. So it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting to see. I think that we have actually done that. We have. <laughs> yeah. Pretty interesting. Yeah. I was, when we tried to put, set wing down on fire and it did nothing, I was like, wow, this is, uh, this is what we're talking about. And the, the thing that I found so interesting about that experiment, I mean, we literally went out, and I, when I say we, I mean, meant mainly Jen, the graduate student at the time that was working on it. She had to collect all these leaves. and, and uh, But anyway, we were, actually went out and put a known ratio of oak to non-oak leaves in a fuel bed. And then and when I say fuel bed, I just mean on the ground in a defined pot, and then came back and tried to burn them. And uh, that was my role in it, best I recall, was just to come and hold the drip torch and uh, let you all measure all the really interesting things going on when I did that. But uh, it didn't take that much, you know, of the ratio being those non-oak species before it really started to affect fire behavior quite a bit. Yeah. And particularly as you increase the amount of non-oak, uh, the fire just didn't, it didn't perform well. It didn't burn well, right? Yeah, that's right. So she had a, uh, we had plots that were all oak, plots that were all non-oaks, and then we had like 33% non-oak and 66% non-oak. And it's a pretty linear trend. Like it's, as soon as you put species in the mix that are not oaks, you decrease the flammability of that fuel bed. And this is just looking at leaf litter. So like I said before, a lot of the fuels in these systems, particularly when they're open and there's a lot of light or herbaceous species, but those leaf litter fuels, which are the dominant fuel in these systems now that we're trying to restore, uh, you, you really have to have a bunch of oak or pine in there to get it to ignite and to burn well. So yeah, so this goes back to what you were saying or alluding to earlier is that it's kind of cool to think about it although not easy to manage for it, but it's like these different trees have different traits that actually help to perpetuate the conditions that they would rather be in. So if you're a tree that does well with like highlight and, and fire coming through every five to seven years, which is what we think it was back in, before we settled this part of the country, um, then you have traits that promote fire. And if you're a tree that liked hanging out by a river where you hardly ever had fire or down in a cove, you've got traits that suppress fire. So it's kind of cool to think to think about how um, individual species kind of have certain traits that either promote that will promote the conditions that they like to live in. Really cool, and uh, to kind of tie that in to what I wanted to talk about a little bit from a management standpoint is uh, bringing it back to what Steve was saying earlier. I can remember looking at some of the historical land cover you know maps and things even I think one of Bartram's called the uh, most of the eastern United States uh, was labeled as Grand Savane or something like that so Grand Savannah and uh, that included a lot of the upland hardwood system so when I think about what that actually means basically means a, a low density forest right so very few trees with a herbaceous dominated understory and 
based on all these different kinds of records, it, it seems like that's probably pretty accurate of what structurally those systems look like. And they, of course, don't look like that now, but we do have some management practices. Uh, I'm thinking specifically like the shelter wood with fire technique, which is specifically designed to regenerate oaks. And, uh, you know, I think about some of the studies that I'm familiar with, and you're probably more familiar with them than I am, uh, where we've tried techniques like that, where the strategy is to go in and actually reduce the amount of canopy. So you're, you have a timber harvest where you remove some of the trees, you leave oaks, uh, you know, at a, at a low basal area in the forest. So you're getting a lot of sun to the ground. And then at some point after, after that initial uh, timber harvest you would come in with fire and uh, as far as I remember those are still pretty inconsistent on regenerating oak. Uh, it, I was curious is, is that your same feeling for what the literature says on that and if so why do you think that is? What, from what I've read uh, um, uh, yeah there is some inconsistency um, uh, it seems like what, from my understanding, is that first of all, you have to have, make sure you have oak regeneration on the ground. That is, you have to have a sprout bank or seedlings because fire itself is not going to pr produce those. Uh, and even opening the canopy itself is not gonna produce that. So you, you do have to have that kind of starting point, um, that potential for uh, oaks to respond. And then I think another thing that's really important with these shelter wood cuts is uh, that you know you open you open up the canopy, but you might want to be wary about going in too soon with a fire. Um, I think that's what uh, several folks have found. I know I've found that with uh, my own research is that you, it 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 seems to work better if you allow uh, oaks that are basically in that sprout bank, small sapling, seedling bank, you allow them the time to actually take advantage of that increased sunlight. I don't know what all is going on there, but I suspect what they're doing is that they're using, they're, uh, using that sunlight to actually build up even greater below ground uh, reserves. And so then what happens then, if that's allowed to happen, <clears throat> you put in a fire, and uh, you'll get a lot of top kill of the oaks and of uh, uh, non-oaks, but the oaks sprout back much more vigorously, taller, not necessarily more sprouts, but taller sprouts. And then what I have found in my own work is that if you come back and burn again, then what you'll see with that, with that sprout size uh, 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 difference between oaks and the non-oaks, is that those uh, sprouting oaks will then be more likely to avoid top kill with a subsequent fire than the non-oaks. And so uh, I've heard of people being able to kind of release oaks with a single fire, you know, delayed a little bit after shelter wood cut, but I think also that it may not maximize the number of oak, you know, uh, stems making it into the uh, uh, mid story or uh, upper story. But with repeated fires, I think that's more likely to kind of knock down the mesophytes and also help to create a more open, maintain a more open canopy. If, you, if we want to keep this, we got to keep burning in order to keep, you know, maintain the opening, open canopy and thus the benefits uh, to, um, to the herbaceous uh, ground layer. Yeah, that's a good point. So, and I think we make that point pretty often we're, when we're using fires to meet uh, management objectives. It's pretty much always the case that you have to use it more than once. You have to continue to use it in a regime. And we talked about that in uh, one of the, the uh, recent episodes that it's really important to think about that regime and what that looks like. So uh, another practice, I guess, Heather and I have, uh, have engaged in on the site behind you and in, in your uh, in your screensaver there, Heather. Uh, so something that, that I found pretty interesting, it might be pertinent for a lot of people that are interested in burning their upland hardwood systems, but they've already kind of gone too far with this 
this process where we have these red maples and other things uh, are making it hard to get fire back in, you may not necessarily have or want uh, the opportunity to harvest timber, but there still are some things that you could do. And uh, one of the things that that uh, we were a part of at, up at, in North Mississippi was a hack and squirt operation where we actually went in and targeted specific stems that are problematic. And uh, you're not going in and harvesting timber, but you're actually just uh, killing individual tree species that are invading that are causing you issues with trying to get fire back in. So uh, I know we put uh, some of that information in the online video, Heather, but I, I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what, you know, what, what's actually happening in that sort of scenario when you go in and do this, this kind of operation where you have this, you know, pretty uh, specific management treatment, like how is that benefiting you from a management objective? Right. And Steve actually could probably talk about this a little bit too, because they did the same thing on his site. But the idea there is just to um, go in and individually target sort of smaller sized off-site individuals. Like we were really interested in getting rid of um, sweet gum and hot porn beam and uh, winged elm. And so you can go in and kind of quickly uh, pack and squirt. So, you know, cut the stem of the tree put some herbicide in there and that'll knock back those guys. And what it does is it, it, it a, keeps them from getting any bigger and including more light, but it also does open up the canopy a little bit, right? Like, I mean, right now, when you go into a lot of these stands, you're lucky if you've got 5% of total sunlight reaching the forest floor. It's usually much, it's usually really low. So just taking out those individuals can open it up five or 10%, which can make a big difference to your oak seedlings or saplings that are growing in the understory. It gives them more energy. And so if you do that, that's a mechanism to kind of get them growing bigger faster. And then you can burn and burn a little bit, knock back some of those guys, um, allow those oaks to continue to, to grow up. And then potentially later come in and take off some of that overstory um, like you mentioned before. But Steve, maybe you want to talk about your luck because you guys had some luck doing this on your Strawberry Plains site, right? And getting your herbaceous understory to look a little bit better. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and originally we're thinking about maybe uh, cutting and removing, you know, some species, but, you know, we didn't really have a big budget for doing that. And so, uh, and we, we, we ended up deciding that we would do basically hack and squirt of the off-site, you know, species. Um, and we also found that it was beneficial maybe to also do that for some of the overstory oaks, just to increase a little bit of the sunlight. We had some data that suggest that, you know, southern red oak may actually be even though it was historically, you know, one of the dominant species, its density today may be a little bit higher than it was historically uh, because of uh, fire exclusion. So we, we, we singled out a few of those too, but we were very selective about, uh, about oaks. And uh, one thing that was, you know, we were also thinking about since this was a Strawberry Plains Audubon Preserve is a bird sanctuary is that the, just by deadening some of these trees, we also created a potential cavity trees for uh, say like redheaded uh, woodpeckers and other cavity nesting uh, species. So that was kind of a side benefit of doing that. And what, what we found is that um, <clears throat> you definitely get a, a strong response of the herbaceous ground cover for oaks uh, to make it through that kind of bottleneck uh, generally, we found that um, that was aided by, you know, some multiple tree fall gaps. So in addition to our, our thinning, having some of the uh, mother nature help us with uh, knocking down a few trees to wind throw, um, it's in those areas combined with maybe backing off the fire frequency. Initially, we started at once every two years. And that was probably too frequent to allow oaks to really 
make it through that, that bottleneck, but we back it off to like three or four years, then you really start to see the oaks coming into their own, into the mid-story. Um, you know, there's still also sweet gum uh, uh, and some of the mesophytes there too, but, um, uh, you know, definitely deadening, just deadening trees, you know, um, uh, can give you part of what you need along with fire. And another advantage of that we thought, although we haven't really looked specifically at this in great detail, is that um, when you're not dragging trees out of there, then you're probably doing less damage to the ground cover. We were always very mindful of what would be happening uh, to the ground cover with any uh, you know, activity that we were doing in there. So um, I, I think it can be done. You know, uh, you know, extraction without doing too much damage to the ground cover, but it has to be uh, done very thoughtfully and carefully with you know people who who know what they're doing um, in that regard. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, I like a lot of things about this. One, sunlight is often a limiting factor in there from my objectives, which is most of the time wildlife habitat. But it sounds like it's important for regenerating the the next generation, so to speak, of oaks, uh, but you're you're also doing it in a really an inexpensive way where you can be pretty specific and get rid of species like you were mentioning that really have a low wildlife value. They're also hampering, you know, they're catching sunlight. They're hampering your use of the tool fire. Uh, so you're you're accomplishing a whole bunch of things at once with this relatively inexpensive and and not very time consuming practice that could be done on a stand by stand basis, depending on your objectives. And it's really uh, getting you a long way and, and uh, getting fire back into the system and getting, you know, some of, depending on what your objectives are, some of these objectives advanced. So, <clears throat> yeah, I really appreciate uh, y'all taking some time to, to talk to us about that. And I was curious if you have any. Uh, take home messages before we end the show for today. I think one thing that's really important for people to think about is that I think it's it's almost deceiving in a way when you walk around in an oak forest because you think, oh, this oak forest looks great. You know, there's all these big, beautiful oaks usually in the overstory, and you're like, oh, everything's good. But you know, if you pay attention and look at what's hanging out. Like, who are the kids of those oaks? Are they actually there? Like, I'm astonished sometimes when I go out and I'm like, there is no regeneration, nothing. There's not a single sapling in this entire stand. And the only, or if they're saplings, it's things like American beech or red maple. And the reality is, is that when those big oaks die, and they will, because most of them are 80 to 100 years old, that's when most of them recruited, it was that time frame ago. Um, they're going to get replaced by non-oaks unless we're actively um, doing things now to promote that regeneration. And then sometimes I know like sometimes it's, you almost cringe a little bit when you're like, you know, Steve said, Oh, we had to, we killed a couple of Southern red oaks and you're like, Oh no, you know, those <laughs> guys, but then you're like, you know, you have, you almost have to do that sometimes because the only way that you're going to get oaks to regenerate is if you keep the understory open enough. And right now, the only way for us to do that is going to be through opening up the canopy some and then maintaining a open enough midstory and understory that those oaks can thrive. And that's probably going to be through some sort of uh, fire program. Um, usually at first, you have to kind of burn pretty frequently. And then you once you get that regeneration there, you've got to lay off because you've got to let those oaks get out of that fire trap that Steve and you were talking about. And so you know, I, I think we're at the point right now where we have to do something or 20, 30 years from now, we're, we're going to be looking at forests that are very, very different than what we have been used to looking at. Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, one point about the aesthetics. Um, you know, I agree with you, uh, Heather, you know, I, you know, I find it pleasant to walk through a closed canopy mature oak uh, forest and it does you know uh, 
it does look nice. Um, and I will say that when, if you decide you want to do this type of restoration where you're going to be deadening or thinning some overstory, uh, hacking and squirting, um, uh, burning, that uh, you, you got to have some patience um, because initially it's not going to necessarily look all that great. Um, but over time, what happens is um, a lot of the dead, you know, trees kind of fall. That herbaceous layer with a lot of uh, showy wildflowers uh, starts to uh, take hold, and it's a different system then, and it has a beauty of its own. Okay, you start to see a lot of really pretty birds showing up. I've I've worked with some landowners that love to see the birds. You know, a lot of those things show up. A absolutely, lots lots of animals, lots of mammals, lot lots of things that are that have been shown to increase in abundance, you know, with this, this type of management. And I would just add with regard to that management of upland oaks, um, I, I guess I would like to see agencies uh, be more accepting of this type of management, of uh, restoring open fire maintained woodlands that are you know dominated by hardwoods by oaks yeah you know, um i think there's there's been definite buy in for pine dominated systems but uh it's been a little bit more of a challenge to convince people of the uh, the advantages of doing this for oak dominated systems and um uh and i think you know and it may i don't know where that comes from it may be that they uh, that it's kind of you know, maybe some foresters don't see the value of fire in an oak system, you know, for its timber uh, value. Um, but clearly there's great value for wildlife. And I think that that, uh, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, more agencies, especially, you know, in, um, here in Mississippi where I am, will, you know, come to embrace that more than they have. That's a really good point, Steve. And I, I do want to point out that in the last um, couple of years or so, there has, I think, at least um, in some of the fire community, you know, been more of an effort to kind of get that message out there, I think. You know, there's been a couple of really good papers that uh, Bryce Hanbury, who's with the Forest, published, and, you know, talking about these open forests being kind of an excluded state and that um, they really serve a lot of functions, you know, particularly for a lot wildlife, like a lot of the biodiversity that we see is in these open forest communities and um, oak forest included. And so I agree. I think that message just needs to get out there a little bit more. Um, you know, there's still a lot of people who don't think fire belongs in a hardwood stand. And, and that's a message that we've been or trying to, uh, you know, get, get the get the word out that the fire is a part of that system. And there's a lot of evidence that shows why um, and it needs to be and has to be. And uh, you're not just damaging your timber trees. If you put fire in a hardwood stand, there's a lot of way to burn those stand and do it responsibly and do it in a way that you can uh, still um, harvest your trees and make money off them. And that's part of your management, management goal. And so I'd like to see that kind of a paradigm shift in the way that we think about fire and hardwood systems. I think that's a, a great way to end with, you know, that's what we're all doing here, right? We're, we're trying to use every means possible and, and then now we're doing it through a podcast, yeah. trying yeah. to get information out to people. So uh, yeah, I think those are great points. Uh, really uh, interesting discussion. I appreciate you both coming on and telling us what, what you know about these systems and, and uh, sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, no problem. Uh, one last thing, if the listeners are interested in following up or, or uh, you know, some of this information, where can they find you all? So you can find me via email. I am uh, social media lacking at this stage, uh, but, um, but it's heather.alexander at auburn.edu. I'd be happy to address anybody's questions. Yeah, email, email is probably a good way to uh, contact me as well. And that's, uh, even though I go by Steve, uh, my email is actually J 
brewer at Ole Miss, O-L-E-M-I-S-S dot E-D-U. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be able to send an email to an old Miss address, I don't think. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, It'll again. go to the junk. It'll go to my junk, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just filter those out immediately. I get it. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you all again coming on the show. Really enlightening talk. And, and uh, thanks, everybody, for listening in. We'll, t- we'll talk to you next time. Our university is part of the Natural Resource University podcast network funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab.